<laughs> it's my pleasure to uh, uh, introduce to you guys uh, Dr. Timothy Taylor, who will be our, our third and final candidate for the regional uh, president uh, search. Uh, we've uh, distributed the biography information in Vita, uh, and there's a website that's online, so you can review that. Um, as uh, with all the candidates, we, uh, Jenny Wang has prepared a, a feedback form that we would ask uh, individuals to complete before leaving. Uh, Dr. Lillian Martinez, uh, and uh, Margaret Malspina and Linda Guzzo are representatives to the Regional Search Committee. Uh, Lillian will actually be meeting with a group tomorrow to share uh, capital feedback. And so what we'll be doing is compiling the feedback from all of the forums and then Lillian will bring that to the group to uh, represent uh, sentiments from our institution. Uh, we have a, uh, a set schedule, so we're, we're here until 9.15. 9.15 or 9.30 actually, 9.30. Uh, and then Dr. Uh, Taylor has to, to get right over to Manchester for the, he's going to be at all five campuses today. And so, but we have him for the first hour and a half. Uh, glad to see some of our, our shining nursing students. And, and so uh, I, I'd imagine that you guys will have some, some, some specific targeted questions to ask uh, as all of our, our scholars at, at Capital Computer College. So without uh, further ado, Dr. Taylor, the floor is yours. Good morning, how are you all? Good morning. It's a bright morning, isn't it? Is it a little scary for you this morning? Having a regional president candidate in? <laughs> I don't know really where we want to start. I mean, I can tell you a little bit about myself. I know that you have my curriculum Vita, and you can tell from the Vita that I have 27 years of higher education experience in positions of increasing responsibility. Throughout my career, I've had lots of opportunities to be involved in just about everything involved with the higher education operations. Um, I grew up as a teacher. I started being a teacher. Uh, I developed and taught seven competency-based courses um, in inner city Milwaukee. It was at a private school. I really loved that job. At that job, though, I learned what a president, the power of a president and the power of policy, how it can help students and how it can detract from student learning and student success. And so I carefully, if you look, you can see that I carefully constructed my career in ways so that I could become a CEO kind of president. Um, from my position as a teacher, I became an associate dean of industrial occupations, agriculture, and apprenticeship in a, in a city called Blackhawk Technical, Co or at a college called Blackhawk Technical College in Janesville, Wisconsin. Uh, there I learned the fundamentals of basic academic administration, things like program development, curriculum development, assessment. I'm an expert, I think, in all things academic. I mean, I really believe I am. I mean, I understand assessment at the institutional program and course levels. Um, I understand uh, faculty development, uh, curriculum development, program development. Uh, I, I have a, a gr very strong background at Blackhawk Technical College working at the state to develop statewide curriculums. Um, so it's very, very strong in that. It's the fundamental administrative operation kinds of things like budgeting, procurement, uh, scheduling, those are all things that are second nature to me. Um, as I transitioned from Blackhawk Technical College to Richland Community College in um, Decatur, Illinois, my focus became divisional, still academic administration focused, but I also learned, good morning, <laughs> isn't that what teachers do, they kind of recognize students that come in late? <laughs> <laughs> to, to encourage better behavior in the future, right? <laughs> so at Richland Community College, I also started to expand my focus to business and industry partnerships, did a lot of work at, in the agribusiness area at Indicator, Illinois, uh, worked with big companies like Archer Daniels Midland, Can uh, Caterpillar, uh, Firestone, those kinds of companies, developed a lot of uh, community partnerships. And then I became a chief operating officer president at a multi-campus environment in southern Illinois called Frontier Community College. Frontier was part of the Illinois Eastern Community College system, one of four campuses. There, I, my focus really expanded beyond uh, program and division level activity, but looked at positioning the college to be a strong economic development entity within the communities. Put a lot of focus on developing uh, in, uh, political partnerships. Uh, put a lot of emphasis on strategic planning, 
facilities planning. I did a, I, in a small rural college in, in southern Illinois, you have to wear many hats, and, and I learned to do things, uh, all things about student services. I became very well versed in student services process. Um, I became uh, very much indoctrinated into the operations and maintenance side of, of, of a college operations. In fact, one of the things that I was able to do as a, a college president was run a project for um, the college to develop five new classrooms. And what I mean by running the project is I was the project manager. <laughs> I, scheduled <laughs> I scheduled contractors. I reviewed specifications. I was spending nights uh, going over architect renderings and specifications to make sure all the parts that we got in met those specifications. I mean, I learned a lot about toilets that I just didn't know <laughs> at the time. Uh, spent nights uh, working with the contractors to make sure and scheduling them to make sure that the build went as smooth as it had to do. So those are things that you wouldn't normally get if you grew up in just the academic side of the house of, or just the student services side of the house. Very, uh, very involved in strategic planning, facilities planning, uh, pretty much everything that you can think of. Owning. If, you, if you can think about all of the things that goes on at a college, I've pretty much been involved with them, led some sort of system or process uh, with the exception of some of the HR things but uh, very well versed in, in academics. At Oakland Community College, uh, one of the largest multi-campus colleges in the nation, 17th largest college in the nation, we have 24, well, between 20 and 24,000 students there, between 300 and 350 faculty, full-time faculty, and uh, about 3,000 employees. Uh, very large environment there. Uh, I worked at Auburn Hills Community College, as, uh, Auburn Hills campus of Oakland Community College as the campus president. I, uh, after a year of doing that, I became the uh, campus, the interim campus president at Orchard Ridge Campus, and those two campuses together of the five of Oakland Community College make up about 70% of the college's enrollment in FTE. And so when you add up all the five colleges in the region of uh, what Connecticut is planning, I'm used to having uh, those number of students, I had those number of employees, uh, because we, and, and that level of budget commitment because that's what I had at OCC. And so, I, personally, that's kind of a quick recap of my resume, but personally, I grew up in, in Illinois. I was born and raised in central, East Central Illinois in a town called Danville. I was a first generation college student. I was from an economically disadvantaged home. I went to, uh, when I graduated high school, I went to Southern Illinois University and promptly flunked out. <laughs> I went back home to, to Danville Area Community College, which helped really save my life. I got a couple degrees and certificate from there, but that really provided me with some confidence to move forward and, and pursue uh, my dreams. Um, I am married. I have three children. My oldest is a freshman at Michigan State. I have twins that are 11 years old, and uh, I like to ride motorcycles. I got a Harley Road King, and whenever I can get on that bike, I'm out having fun. So. Those are some things that I like to do. Um, I know this is a scary proposition for you. There's a lot of change about, and I want to give you opportunities to give me uh, all the questions that you have so that I can try to help make things better. So that's where we're at. So let's get started with some questions. And we're going to ask that folks can, can ask from the microphone so that it, uh, we had some challenges with the acoustics here. So if you can ask. This is kind of formal. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Lilia Martinez. <laughs> I have a question. How would you define shared governance? And can you give us an ex a specific example where your shared governance was a critical component of your decision-making process? Well, shared governance, um, I, I, I subscribe to the joint definition between AGB and AUP where they talk about shared governance is the opportunity for employees to provide input into the decision-making process uh, where clear lines of accountability are, are formed. Uh, and so I think those two things working together are important. You know, employees need to have uh, opportunities to uh, have input on, specifically on policies, procedures, guidelines, administrative rules on the way things work in an operation of a higher education institution. I think that's a critical component. Uh, the accountability piece, though, I think is also a critical component because when things 
uh, don't work or do work we want to be able to uh, know who's responsible so that we can either give praise or make corrections so that we can uh, achieve the ends that we want so I think shared governance I mean I've been a strong comp a pro proponent of shared governance throughout my career I know there's multiple ways to engage in, sh in shared governance and I've seen it at different colleges work differently but I've, I've been very active in uh, pro promoting shared governance uh, throughout my organizations uh, you asked for an example one of the examples um, or one of the things that I will do as a regional president but also have done at Frontier Community College and Oakland Community College is I try to form strategic partnerships with the shared governance leaders because I understand that uh, those are the campus influencers or the college influencers and so uh, when I went to front or Oakland Community College I reached out to our campus Senate president and developed a strong relationship with with him at the time uh, I also developed a relationship with the, the, the vice chair of the, of, the, of the Senate so that we could um, work together and, and and solve problems particularly as it relates to academic policy I see those as key influencers uh, now at Oakland Community College we had a structure where uh, we had five campuses each campus had their own Senate but that Senate then was kind of a subcomponent of the larger college Senate and so I made I made connections with the, the college senate and the campus senates uh, and then the, the senate has a leadership council they had a council of uh, I think 14 uh, faculty members that I d developed strong relationships some of them were chairs of the assessment committee some of them were chairs of the curriculum committee some of them were chairs of, of the faculty development committees and those kinds of things but trying to make strong uh, trusting mutual respectful relationships because if you don't develop those kinds of relationships then you really can't solve problems because people are afraid to share information or people uh, are afraid to hurt feelings uh, and so if you can't really talk about the real problems and real issues because you're afraid or you don't have those strength the strength in relationships then you can't solve problems and so one of the things I will do is to try to create a, a strong sense of, of, of friendliness a strong sense of connection uh, with the shared with the campus with the college influencers so that we could help make change together I think that's important as an example of a process that we were able to do um, I was having lunch with the, the um, assessment chair of the faculty senate the college senate and she was talking to me about uh, worries that she had that the, they weren't getting enough input from career tech ed faculty into the institutional uh, outcome process and I listened to her concerns and uh, we had some ideas that we kind of shot back and forth but uh, essentially uh, they were just ideas I gave her some op, uh, some examples of organizations I thought did a pretty good job of engaging CTE faculty into that process and asked her to, to go in, research and see if there's some things that that could work for OCC in the meantime I, I reached out to the college senate chair and said you know this person's having a problem getting CTE faculty engaged what's your perceptions on what we could do to improve the situation and he said well Tim one of the problems that we're having is we have 12 Senate seats available where CTE faculty aren't reserved for CTE faculty but they're not participating and so he and I kind of got it in our, our in our lunch we got together and we said you know what let's go out and recruit some and, and we did and of the 15 people we asked we got the 12 that we needed and they became part of the conversation uh, they became part of the Senate chair so that helped strengthen the Senate uh, from a lot of perspectives but in those conversations with CTE faculty we learned we felt we learned from them that they felt well we called them general education outcomes they felt well those aren't our responsibility we're, we're career faculty um, and so then we started talking about well you know what in your advisory committees what are they telling you they need from students you need to be able to communicate with our team with our customers you need to be able to participate in teams you need to be able to solve problems and think complexly those are all things that happen in your advisory committees those are all things that happen in every career cluster that I've ever been with and if I've ever talked to all advisory committees and I've really talked to thousands of employers throughout my years they're telling me these same things before they say and we need somebody who can troubleshoot a a computer or somebody who can uh, administer medicine or something along those lines so as the as the faculty started to see a common sense of purpose 
and, and they started to develop a shared vision about what these general ed outcomes were, that we started getting better participation from the CTE faculty in those uh, outcomes. And I think they did well. The, our uh, Higher Learning Commission, which is uh, the, the, the Central America's version of, is it called NEASC? Is that the? Mechi, Mechi now. They just changed their name, Mechi. Mechi? Okay, uh, thank you for that <laughs> heads up. So it's, it's the, the accrediting body. And so uh, they just came in a couple of, last week, March 19th, and uh, did well. So I think we're doing it, we're, we did a lot of things well. So just getting people, but those things wouldn't have happened if we not had that strong relationship to begin with. Uh, we had a strong sense of, of trust in each other uh, to work through and solve the problems. And uh, I think that that's, that's the real strength of shared governance. And I think uh, it's an important element to help colleges uh, develop a, a strong sense of responsiveness to student needs. That's probably a long answer. All righty, what else? Hi, Dr. Taylor. So again, my name is Kathy Heron. So you mentioned relationships, and my question to you is, if you were the president of five community colleges in the eastern part of the state, that's a lot of distance, a lot of staff and faculty, how would you develop relationships with us? Well, the key is, and, and I have the same situation at Oakland Community College. We were five campuses. Um, the Auburn Hills campus is, of course, in Auburn Hills, Michigan. Our Orchard Ridge campus was in Farmington Hills, Michigan. Now, um, I was the interim president at, at Orchard Ridge and at, at uh, Auburn Hills. But 12 miles in Oakland County, Michigan, still takes about an hour, sometimes more, because of the traffic. It's just a two million people congested in one county. It's kind of, it's, the traffic's pretty, pretty uh, heavy. But I think part of just developing relationships is taking the time to go out and meet people. Uh, I, I created um, ways to participate uh, and, and engage with people. We had things like uh, coffee with the president. Coffee with the President was designed to get a diverse group of individuals th throughout the, ca the campus together so that we could talk about issues facing the campus. Um, we had faculty, we had staff, we had students sometimes come to the Coffee with the President. We had lunch with the President. The lunch with the President was for students. Uh, and so we invited students to come in and the students would tell us what they liked and what uh, the college was doing, what the college did well, what the college needed to do to uh, some of the challenges that the students were facing, and I invited staff and faculty to come in and listen, not respond, but listen to what the students were saying so that we could use those kinds of information into our strategic planning processes. I had things like uh, dinner with the president for adjunct faculty, uh, so that adjunct faculty and evening uh, employees could get, a, uh, get informed about what was going on. I had something called community assembly. Community assembly was uh, an opportunity, for, again, for any employee to come in and, and talk to me about uh, what was going on. Also, for me to communicate what was going on at the district office strategically, where we were planning to go financially, what kind of challenges we were facing. Um, so, community assembly I used when I was president, I broadcast it from, or webcast it from, from either Auburn Hills campus and then the Orchard Ridge folks could watch it, or, and then the next time I'd, I would broadcast from Orchard Ridge and Auburn Hills could, could watch it. But it was interactive, it was, it was synchronous, and so everybody had an opportunity to participate. We use opportunities for morale building. Uh, one year at spring break um, in Michigan, Southeast Michigan, Detroit is a major influence. Uh, on the, the college, and of course, our, all of our faculty are, are Detroit Tigers fans, or all of our staff are Detroit Tigers fans. Now, I'm from Illinois, so I'm a Cubs fan, so I don't really care about Tigers, but, <laughs> but uh, because spring break is always around the opening day in Oakland County, the faculty had off, but our staff uh, felt like they were missing out and wanted to have some time off, but they really wanted to see the opening day ceremonies for the Detroit Tigers. And so somebody had an idea, hey, let's broadcast it. And then somebody had an idea, hey, we got this me nice mezzanine out here, let's have a cookout. And so we did that. So we were looking for ways to increase the morale. And so looking for opportunities to increase morale, engage, I think those are ways also to uh, get in and communicate. We had chili cook off. Uh, I had the hot chili champion. I got that certificate. Uh, most people couldn't eat it, but <laughs> maybe that's why I won. <laughs> 
Uh, but uh, we just, you know, just looking for ways to engage and, and, and help morale. We, um, so just creating those opportunities, I think blending the five campuses into a region or the five colleges into a region, it's going to be some challenges trying to, to do that communication. But that's kind of what my job is, is to create that communication link to be your advocate for uh, the, the college at the, at the system level. And so that's what I intend to do, and I have a lot of experience doing that, and I think that I'll be able to do that very well. Oops. So uh, Connecticut law does not require motorcyclists to wear helmets. Would you wear a helmet here? <laughs> it depends. <laughs> it's the same in Michigan. Um, when I'm driving on the interstate, man, those people drive crazy. So I wear a helmet. If I, if I know it's going to be a lot of high traffic area, I wear a helmet. But, you know, the freedom to not wear a helmet is, is nice. And, it, and I like riding out into the country the rural areas and so where I live in in Clarkston Michigan I can get out into the rural area in, in about two or three minutes and so I don't wear a helmet when I do that I probably should my wife doesn't necessarily <laughs> embrace that strategy but uh, I, I, you know I like it did he answer that better than the other candidates you mentioned you're a motorcyclist. Um, my name is Jeff Partridge. I'm the chair of the humanities department. Uh, I lead 70 faculty in that department, 10 of whom are full time. Uh, so my question is about contingent faculty. Um, they're a great asset to our college, uh, but also uh, contingent faculty have been described as an exploited class. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about your views on uh, the way that higher ed is using, and particular community colleges are using ad and relying on adjunct faculty? Well, adjunct faculty is uh, clearly one of the more important elements of what we do in teaching uh, students. Be uh, there's some strengths to having adjunct faculty in, uh, in, in the classroom. I think one of the more important strengths is a lot of times those folks are practicing the courses, the programs in which they're teaching, and they can bring new knowledge into the classroom that sometimes full-time faculty don't have the opportunity to do because of their full-time job. And so I think there's some advantages there. I think the uh, disadvantages is they're not always committed to uh, the things that we need to do in higher education to be successful. A lot of times faculty won't be, uh, adjunct faculty won't want to engage heavily in assessment. They don't understand assessment practices. They don't understand why it's important. Uh, they don't like to necessarily engage in our persistence and retention efforts. Uh, uh, you know, if you're in, uh, one of the things that I think is important as we move forward into the future is looking at intrusive advising. Uh, first alert kind of programs. A, a lot of adjunct faculty don't understand the, the need to get involved in first alert retention processes. And so it creates challenges for us to be able to, to educate those faculty on the on reasons why. But I think we have to pay attention to those, those folks and try to meet their needs. And, and one of the things that we did at Frontier Community College is, is I'm a kind of a person who uh, likes to empower people. When I, I like to delegate responsibility, but also the authority to make change. Um, and then, uh, you know, we will agree to some kind of uh, metrics or accountability principles, but then hold folks accountable to those, those, those ideas and, and decisions. At Frontier Community College, I was working with my dean of academics, uh, who would be a vice president of academics at other institutions, the chief academic officer. Uh, and one of the things that Frontier Community College does, that makes it unique and different is that we had five full-time faculty members and about 750 adjunct faculty. Now, the reason why that is because the, the college was built to be a, what was called in the 70s the College Beyond Walls. But what that meant is we had 11 county service area and we had courses in every church, municipal building, uh, high school that in every community and so we had adjunct faculty in, in 12 you know 12 different communities and we were meant to, that's the way the college was designed but because of the way the college was was built it provided us with a, a, a fair amount of challenge of keeping adjunct faculty engaged in, in the process and so my dean developed a, a, a orientation structure 
he developed a structure, the, uh, kind of a, an, an intrusive structure, so they would go out and visit and, and connect with the, uh, the adjunct faculty. And uh, we started seeing a tremendous, more, uh, a tremendous amount of engagement from adjunct faculty that we didn't see before because of these programs. And because of that, the colleges really did a better job of retention and persistence. And if you look at, uh, if you can find American Institute of Research data from 2012 or 13, you'll find that Frontier Community College led the nation in student completion and, and uh, success because of our adjunct faculty becoming more engaged with students and, and participating in our process. So just paying attention to them, working with them, helping them learn the processes, connecting with them, again, building those relationships, I think they're important. It's important for a number of reasons, and you can, you can say they're exploited or not. I mean, that's, that's really a matter of personal opinion and philosophy. I personally believe that we can do a better job of engaging them. I think we could probably do a better job of, of paying them. But they're also super important because we just can't afford in higher education, public higher education, to pay, uh, to pay full-time faculty. If I had a preference, I would have all full-time faculty. Uh, because I, I see a, a stronger engagement, I see a, a stronger commitment to the program and students from full-time faculty. But at the, the reality is, is we have to use adjunct faculty because that's the best way that we can bring programs and courses to the, a broader audience of our students. So I guess that's my perspective. But some are really, really good. Um, and I, I think that's, a, you know, we talk about diversity, inclusion, and equity in the educational environment. And one of the ways to expand the, that diversion, or the, the <laughs> diversity, equity, and inclusion is to bring in different kinds of adjunct faculty, uh, to bring in uh, different ideas, perspectives, ethnicities, uh, to, ex to mentor those adjunct faculty. A lot of times those adjunct faculty can become our full-time faculty in the future. So there's, there's lots of opportunities to work with it and develop those, those uh, environments. And creating that diverse environment within the classroom really serves our students in, in well. And they learn to work with a lot of individuals from different uh, uh, backgrounds and, and it, it improves the learning process, clearly. Okay, that steps right into my question. Um, as a former member of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee, um, we have a very <coughs> diverse campus. Uh, we do. Almost 50% of our students identify as black or African American. We have nearly 30% Latino. And, you know, a, a large Muslim population. I mean, we have students from all over the world. Certainly. So you'd be, I liked to hearing what you just said about, you know, making sure that we have diversity in our faculty and staff that represents our students which is a tough bill to fill. Um, what I'd like to know is, with your experience, what do you feel is your greatest achievement related to diversity and inclusion, and how could you bring that here? Well, I've been involved with diversity, equity, and inclusion committees throughout my career. I mean, from the time I was at Black Hawk Tech to uh, most recently at OCC. Uh, I would really like to describe two experiences. Uh, the, one of, I think, the most uh, learning-oriented experience that I had and one that really helped shape my ideas on diversity, equity, and inclusion is uh, Richland Community College had, was part of uh, the Higher Learning Commission's AQIP process. Now, if you're not familiar with what AQIP is, it's kind of a quality improvement accreditation model that's based off of Baldridge, kind of the Baldridge, uh, Malcolm Baldridge criteria. As part of that, the college does improvement projects as part of its accreditation process. And one of the improvement projects that we wanted to do was look at diversifying faculty. And I led the team uh, to diversify our faculty. Our goal for, was to attract uh, five new uh, faculty members into the college's, diverse faculty members into the college's ranks. And we recognized that there was an opportunity due to retirements and so forth. And so we were really trying to make sure that our candidate pools were very uh, reflective of the community in which we lived. As we went through this process, we identified three strategies. Uh, the first was to uh, cr create a training program for our employees so that we could understand diversity. The second was to um, reach out to community organizations and partnerships to get them involved with uh, the college and so that we could uh, have a, an avenue to communicate our, our, 
our desires and needs for uh, uh, diverse faculty. And then the third was to, we went out and, and, and recruited HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, to try to attract African American faculty into the organization. The AQIP process is a seven step process. It takes about three or four years to go through the entire process, um, at least the way we implemented it. And we were very successful at attracting faculty at the institution. We were able to attract three African American fa faculty members, a Hispanic faculty member, and a faculty member who identified herself as LGBTQ. What we learned as we were going through is first of all, recruiting HBCUs didn't work at all. Uh, for us. What really, the strategy that really paid off was connecting with our community organizations. But after three years, so even before these faculty members got tenure, we lost all of our African American faculty members. And so when we started trying to figure out why, we started understanding that we asked these folks to do more than we asked other new faculty to do. They served on all of our committees because they were our diverse representative. They, we asked them to do more than we would ask a new faculty member to do. They didn't feel like they were included in the environment. And so what we learned from that is there's a real strong connection between diversity, equity, and inclusion. We didn't have an inclusive environment. They didn't feel part of it. We weren't treating them fairly in terms of equity. And uh, of course, so there's, uh, to me, diversity, equity, and, and inclusion are a three-legged stool for the same thing. And so that really, that's what I learned from that is that we have to pay attention to all three elements in order to be successful in, in diversifying our, our staff. Learning that, I th and I would say the most successful thing that I was able to do is at Oakland Community College was one of the things I was hired to do is to work with our board of trustees to develop policies, to redevelop new policies. Our board um, decided to move into a Carver policy model uh, many years ago, and they weren't making progress in doing that. But when it comes to accountability, it has to start at the board level. There has to have a policy that says to the CEO of the organization or the campus uh, president or the chancellor or whatever that individual is that works directly with the board, that these are the things that we expect from you as an institution. And if you look at the Oakland Community College's diversity, equity, and inclusion policy, it talks about the expectations the board has in terms of what the community expects of the college. It talks about metrics of success for the organization. It, the, it defines how the college wants to move those metrics and uh, then the, the strategic initiatives that uh, can flow into the, the board policy. So creating that accountability framework, because if there's no accountability framework, then most of the time initiatives won't work. And so, uh, but creating that strong accountability framework from the board, holding our chancellor accountable to these metrics and these uh, goals uh, that the board has, then the chancellor can then work with the, the, the presidents, the vice presidents, and create strategic initiatives to move these metrics in the direction that the board wants to see move. So I think to me, and I'm a policy individual, I, I really have seen the, how policy influences student success. I think that's the, probably the strongest uh, piece. But we're, we're measuring diversity, we're measuring equity, and we're measuring inclusion as part of that whole policy piece uh, because it's so important to make sure that our culture and the environment reflects the communities and businesses in which we live and serve. Hi again, Margaret Malaspina, Director of Financial Aid. Um, you have brought up some specific examples of, um, you know, things you've already experienced, but I'd like you to kind of give us a more direct idea as to your approach on leadership. Well, uh, my approach on leadership is, um, is simply, I mean, I, I try to reach personal connections. I think that's, that's part, of, uh, part of being a leader, is reaching out, creating personal connections, being available and visible, being able to communicate. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if I were regional president if I show up uh, in your office someday or show up in a classroom, uh, come to student events, come to campus events, college events. 
and I'm going to struggle with going between campus and college because I've used that vernacular for so long. But I, that, just connecting with it. I think leading by example. I think creating a, a, a situation where I have expectations and, and I communicated them and, and uh, I encourage my senior leadership team to act according to uh, my lead. Uh, just trying to lead by example. Creating a, a sense of shared ideas, sh shared responsibility. Looking at common interests, common goals. Uh, trying to look at ways to bring people together as a, and to address the ways in which we divide uh, collectively. And so that's kind of, I'm, I'm going to collab, you'll hear people talk about collaborative, being a collaborative or transformative leader, but I truly am a collaborative and transformative leader. I desire the collaboration. I, I think it's important. I've learned over the years that the outcomes are so much more rich when people are involved in the discussion, when people are involved in the actions and implementation of ideas. Um, and I have also been involved in organizations where one idea worked and that same idea didn't work in another organization. And ultimately it comes down to this, for things to work and for things to get better, for ch people have to implement them, not me. Because you're the ones that are working with students on a day-to-day -day frontline basis. And you know what will work for your group of, of of people that you're trying to serve, and you know what won't. And uh, as long as we're open to ideas of, sh of sharing new ideas and, and taking some creative risk um, to, uh, to data informed risk, uh, I, I'm all for that. I'm, I'm all for learning. I think, you know, I have a principle, and I think we can all say this and share this and say, learning is our purpose. That's one of our, my, my primary purpose principles. Learning is our purpose. And if that's the case, we need to learn together, not only for students, but also as employees of, of a college. And so um, I think it's okay to make mistakes. I think it's okay to take risk and have them not work out, uh, as long as we can learn from them and then we try to continuously improve. A lot of times leaders will say, we got to be the best at this or the best at that. And, and that's great, but I, I'm, I'm a little different in that I just want us to be the best at getting better uh, if, because to me that's so much less stress <laughs> you know hey w we did this it worked to this l level we think it can come to here or it worked at this level this was probably a one-time shot maybe it won't it won't continuously be there but what can, what did we learn from it how can we improve and ultimately what, how will it affect uh, students learning and uh, success in the future. So as long as we have those, those common notions, uh, we have respect and, and trust and, and in some ways what I call love for each other, then I think we can, move, uh, we can move mountains. We can do lots of things that we didn't think that we could do. At Frontier Community College, the dean who implemented that uh, adjunct faculty program, clearly empowered, clearly accountable. He did stuff with 700 adjunct, well, between five or 700 adjunct faculty, depending on the semester that we never thought was possible before. And the reason is because he, was, he, felt, he felt engaged, he felt empowered, he felt responsible for the outcomes, and he worked to make sure that it worked. And that's how people lead. I, uh, in my view, that's how I lead, anyway, is I, I, I uh, create a sense of, of urgency around students' success and student learning. Um, I create an accountability structure, but I empower people, and then I give them the authority to make the the choices that they need to make so that we can be responsive to our students' needs. My name is Margaret, and I'm a nursing student here at Capitol, graduating in seven weeks, <laughs> along with my clinical group here. And what I can tell you from our clinical experience is definitely wear a helmet, even rural areas. <laughs> <laughs> did have a patient that was riding his motorcycle at night when a deer ran out. And that did not end well for him. He was in a hospital bed for quite some time. But um, like most of my classmates, I think we chose uh, the nursing program here at Capital because of its affordability. And um, while an associate's degree is a great foundation for our nursing career, mm -hmm we definitely have to move on to higher education in order to sustain you know, a job in the future in the nursing career. Um, so I think one of the challenges we're having right now nearing graduation is looking at further at 
further education, continuing getting our bachelor's or master's. And I don't know if you have, one of the challenges is finding a program now that is gonna be easily transferable and like just it. as affordable. So do you also have experience with building relationships with other schools mm -hmm. that will make that transition a little bit smoother? So you're looking from RN to BSN? Yeah. Um, literally, I mean, worked with hundreds of colleges in, in my career as associate dean and dean and, and president. Uh, many of those were looking at uh, REN to BSN programs. One of, one of the, the programs that we were able to work out at, at uh, Frontier Community College, recognizing this trend, which was really started about 10, 12, 15 years ago, listening to the hospitals. Um, I had a strong relationship with some of the local hospitals, the CEOs, uh, the board members, and they were saying these are reasons why we need BSN uh, uh, nurses. And a lot of it had to do with the economic model for hospitals and the way that they can charge and bill and so forth. And so it made I understood that. And so it became clear because many of our RN students get these jobs and then they somewhat become place bound because they have to work. Right? And uh, they have families and they have uh, 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 social responsibilities that are all important to them. And so picking up and moving from southern Illinois to northern Illinois or central, uh, another place in central Illinois to get a BSN just wasn't going to work for them. And so we went out and we created a, a relationship with the University of Illinois Rockford, uh, which was a, a tremendous, their focus was on rural health and, and so that's why we chose them. And uh, we, then we also created, a, but what they were able to do is they would offer classes in, in a region where nurses could take the courses regionally. So the, you'd have to make a commitment uh, uh, to take some weekend classes. Uh, some of the work was online, but some of the clinical experiences weren't. And so we had to work with hospitals as well and uh, doctor's offices to get some release time, some paid release time. And so eventually we brought uh, Southern Illinois Rural Health, we brought uh, University of Illinois Rockford, we brought three Southern Illinois hospitals together and we formed what was called the Southern Illinois Rural Health Network. And we all defined what the, uh, uh, the, the challenges were for our BSN student, uh, BSN seeking students. And we all agreed to certain uh, parameters that would allow for students to uh, create that. It also helped the hospitals recruit new doctors. In, in Southern rural regions, it's very difficult to get doctors into a, a community. And that was one of the goals of the hospitals is to get new doctors, also technicians, uh, radiation ther uh, technicians, uh, radiologic, uh, surgical technicians, uh, biomed, uh, electrical focused technicians. And so we created this Southern Illinois Rural Health Network to uh, bring in these opportunities for our, our students and um, our community. And it worked well. It's still it's it's very robust in Southern Illinois. Uh, the ho the hospital in Fairfield that I was working at was able to attract five new doctors. Uh, uh, the nursing uh, staff there, many of them, I think they they were close to 60 or 70 percent with BSNs by the time I left. I don't know where they're at now. Uh, we were able, but the great news was is we were able to get. Uh, <laughs> more clinical sites or clinical opportunities for our students. We were able to expand some of our health, other program, health programs because they had uh, proctor, uh, no, I call proctor, preceptors uh, for some of the allied health programs. And so that was a, a benefit for all. I mean, at first it didn't really seem like it was a benefit for the college, but being engaged uh, for the college, mainly for our students to get that BSN was the, the primary start, but it had a greater opportunities for the college later on down the road. So being involved in the community, being involved in listening to the problems. I think colleges, the community college is the best positioned or resource in the, in the community to do those things, bring people together and create uh, economic opportunities for the region, but also uh, development opportunities for our students and community members. Did you have a question too? Yeah, she did. <laughs> Don't let her hog the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Taylor, so my name is 
is Chanel, a senior nursing student here, and my question to you is regarding international students. So um, my question is, um, what will you do or how do you think we'll be able to facilitate international students in, in the quest for a search for um, equal opportunities here in the United States? Well, there's a number of different st strategies that might work. Um, and so I don't know exactly what will work for um, Region 1 campuses here in Connecticut. But some of the things that, uh, that, that do work at other colleges is this focus on internationalizing the curriculum, uh, creating a, a global studies certificate uh, so that our students can experience uh, uh, different kinds of uh, teaching and learning opportunities within the classroom that would apply in, on a global environment. To make some of those work, a lot of times student uh, colleges will form uh, alliances with other colleges in, in, a, in a different country. Uh, they call them sister colleges or, and create an exchange program so that students can, uh, from Europe can come here and we can send students to Europe to create that international focus. So that, that's a strategy that might work. Uh, Working in uh, uh, economic development to improve businesses, to bring in businesses. In Oakland County, Michigan, a, a major strategy of the county is to bring in international businesses. In the auto industry right now, and Detroit is the heart of the auto industry, uh, we can't find enough engineers. We can't find enough CNC machinists. And so part of the development strategy in Oakland County is to bring in international companies. And they're very successful at it. We've got companies from Brazil. We've got companies from uh, China, Korea, all over Europe, Canada. I mean, it's, we're, there's literally a thousand companies brought in last year from international or uh, from outside the United States. This diversifies our society, of course, and then it also allows uh, us opportunities to to uh, bring in uh, different kinds of techniques to the classroom, bring in different kinds of uh, sp uh, speakers, those kinds of things uh, to diversify our curriculum. Uh, so diversifying our economy is a way to create a, uh, a more internationally focused. And then uh, some colleges use athletics as, a, as an opportunity to recruit international students. And it, it wouldn't be uncommon to go look at some of these colleges and see where, where they brought in soccer players from, from South America or or uh, the, the Middle East or, 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 you know, or Europe. And so there, there's lots of different strategies. I think we have to find out what works best for the Connecticut colleges. And, 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 but there has to be a strategic focus. And what I mean by that is it has to be an initiative that the, co that the entire you know, system believes in. And I think it does, and they've stated it. And then what are some initiatives that we want to do to internationalize our student body, to internationalize our faculty, to internationalize our staff, uh, so that we can create uh, opportunities for students to, to gain that, that, uh, that benefit of, of interacting with students from around the world. And it's important, and the reason why is, and I was talking to someone earlier, Chrysler World Headquarters, uh, it's now National Headquarters, Fiat Chrysler, was 100 yards from Oakland Community College's Auburn Hills campus. And so I could go and I could watch engineers work in the workplace. And what I saw in those offices were engineers that were communicating with people from China and South Korea and Europe simultaneously. It's a global workplace. And so if we're preparing students for the workplace, we need to be able to provide them with those kinds of experiences in the classroom so that they can help learn and, and, and develop so that they can be better uh, prepared for the, for the for the jobs in which they've come here to train for. So that's, um, those, that's my ideas. They're not probably very good, but uh, it's going to take some time to get to understand what the college, uh, college's needs are, what strategies are in place, and then uh, really put some focus and resource behind uh, doing that for students. But I think it's a, it's a priority. Cheryl Lee, nursing department to introduce myself the first time. Um, you are coming into a situation with this consolidation of the entire system into regional areas. 
to put it mildly, is not popular with the faculty and staff. There's a lot of concerns on many levels, both financially and uh, job security. Sure. So what is this may become contentious, you know, more than it's, strike that. That's okay. What, what are you going to do? I mean, why, why do you feel this is a good place for you coming into this situation? Well, Oakland Community College was in a similar situation when I went to there. Um, Oakland Community College, five campuses, okay. Uh, they were very decentralized campuses. And because of the economics of the situation, the college was running a $20 million deficit on its budget. They had to look at centralizing a lot of things going on. Uh, and so that was the strategy for Oakland Community College to address this $20 million deficit was to centralize. And so it's very similar to what's going on here in Connecticut, although Connecticut's at a little bit larger scale. And so I understand what, what I understand the politics behind it, I understand the finance behind it, but I understand the human reasons behind it. And part of the, you know, the, the culture, if you, if you could, and I would encourage you to do this, look at the culture of Oakland Community College. It was played out in the media in 2014. The campus was described as toxic. Faculty and staff and administrators were fighting openly in public at meetings. Uh, people were at each other's throat. It was, it was just a terrible environment. I was hired because of my, skills and abilities in bringing people together in, in working through that. Part of the reasons that people are, are fearful is because they don't understand. There's not a, a communication structure in place. People don't feel like they're being listened to and heard. Uh, and so creating that system of, uh, and structure so that there's a, a strong communication and advocacy structure put in place. I think that helps alleviate that. Uh, creating those personal relationships, creating that trust and respect and open communication, which are essential to shared governance, but also essential to, to use day-to-day -day life of working together. Those things have to be established and, and built, intended to, and, and for refreshed continuously over time. Acting consistently, uh, talking openly and honestly, dealing with real problems. Those are the things that you have to be able to do to, to, to move beyond that. But if you look and you talk to uh, faculty and staff that I worked with at Oakland Community College. You could see transition, that culture change. Specifically, it started at the Auburn Hills campus. You saw it then start to uh, permeate at the Orchard Ridge campus. I had a team of presidents that I worked with that were at the other three campuses, and we shared ideas and thoughts, and when they started implementing some of these thoughts and ideas at their campuses, and you could start to see a, a groundswell of change at the campus level. And because of our attentiveness to people, their personal needs, and communicating openly and honestly. That doesn't mean that we didn't make tough decisions. We did. We had to close some programs that were low performing. We had to make, uh, we had to uh, create uh, incentives for people to take early retirement. Uh, we had what was called a hiring chill. But we made those tough decisions together, and we communicated reasons why. Not everyone's always going to agree. And that's okay. You want to embrace that. You want to actually encourage that because it's where creativity comes from. But at the same time, understanding, knowing that you've been heard and listened to has a sense of, and creating that respect and, and mutual res relationships has an ability to heal and, and bring people together as opposed to divide. And I think that that's what's needed here. And this is an exciting opportunity. It's not every day you get a chance to create a new community college. And I think it's important for us to think about this. There's really two major things going on in education these days that really has, brings a lot of excitement to the table. First is, this last fall, a new generation of students entered our classrooms. Uh, a lot of sociologists are calling these students the Gen Z. Now that's not very creative. I mean, the millennials were Gen Y for a while before they became millennials. But this gener new generation of students are distinctly different from the last millennial generation and very different from the Xers and boomers. This, these students are traditionally more multicultural. They're collaborative. They're highly creative. I mean, I've got my 11 year olds have YouTube channels and they put their cat videos up for their friends to see. My oldest has a Cody's blog and he has 60 or 70. They're highly creative. But most importantly, they have high expectations for personalized service. 
if you think about that, they've grown up in an environment where Google and Amazon has always existed. You could get a notification on your phone the minute a new song drops that they're interested in, or you know, any other. They have those high expectations for personalized services. That has implications for us as educators providing a service to them. The services that we used to work for, for uh, boomers and Xers probably isn't going to work. It's going to have to be adapted in new ways. So that's one of the trends we need to think about. The second thing that we need to think about is there's a lot of advances in educational technology these days. Augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, gaming theory, uh, data analytics, um, cloud computing. All of these things have the potential to help us reshape our, our teaching and learning and services in ways that are new and exciting and potentially uh, exciting for this new group of students. For us to be able to take advantage of these, we have to be able to work together. We have to be able to pool resources. One of the ideas that I have, it may not be a good one, but you know, the early alert, intrusive advising processes is something that we look at as a potential for improving student persistence and retention. There's things called geo, you know, are you familiar with geofencing? Not that one. No. Well, geofencing, uh, beacon technology. Ge well, geofencing, you, you've got a location-based service in your phone. Geofencing, uh, you can put a geofence around an area and you can uh, push messages out to, to individuals who've opted in. So have you, if you've ever been by a mall and all this, or you go by, a, my, uh, I went by GameStop the other day with my uh, kids and I got a message on my phone, hey, 20% off games or you go by Macy's and you, <laughs> you get that, that's, that's, a, that's kind of a, a geofence, and so you can push those messages out. But it, beacon technology is kind of like a geofence, but it's indoors. They use beacons throughout the organization so that you can push to messages to a phone. So as part of a, a, a early alert process, let's say we could, let's, let's pretend that there was a way to, to tie uh, the gradebook to our administrative database and we knew when students were struggling, let's say, in math. And they were walking by the Student Success Center, and they got a message that says, hey, we've got a tutoring session popping up at 3 o'clock on Algebra 2. To do that, you need a fusion of technology, right? You need a fusion of, of beacons. You need a fusion of uh, administrative database. You need a fusion of a cell service and so forth. To take advantage of that, you probably can't do it as one community college. But as you put multiple community colleges together or a system together, all of a sudden you have that purchasing power, you have that, uh, that, that power to, to build those kinds of systems and, and processes. And so I think that's the strength of, of this regional approach. Um, and so well, one of the strengths of this regional approach. And so I think that, you know, that's one of the ways that we could work together. Okay. Moving back to your comment about the restructuring at the program you were at, that's uh, what we're seeing here is we're told that this consolidation is going to save us money and yet we see the levels of administrative added and the cost of that. With the program that you were on, I'm sure they probably did the similar thing. You have a higher level administrators in order to oversee the process. How successful was it financially and how long did it take to realize any uh, gain to the level of faculty, staff and students? Well, it's a little bit different because Oakland Community College is, is one college. Um, and so we had very uh, easy access to our college financial picture. You know, it's not trying to bring 12 colleges together and showing how this worked. But it, it took a couple years. And, and one of the key strategies for us was, well, really two key strategies for us. One was, um, well, there's actually multiple key strategies. We eliminated a lot of programs and certificates that weren't uh, doing well. We had a lot of, we had over 180 programs at Oakland Community College and probably a third of them weren't producing, didn't have any enrollment or, or one or graduate every four or five years. And so we looked at programs and services that, that weren't performing and we had kind of just eliminated those. It was not really that controversial, although it seems like it was. But I think the key, one of the things that made a key difference was is we started working with the Faculty Association, which is the union, and there's seven unions at Oakland Community College. We started working with each union and we started talking about ways in which we could incent uh, people who were are, who are ready to retire to retire. And so we looked at early retirement options. We put what was together, it was a hiring chill, 
And uh, so what that meant is we evaluated each, every time somebody retired or, or left the organization, we started looking at um, ways in which we could restructure a position or use technology to leverage uh, the position. For example, we went to an automatic payroll system which helped us reduce two or three positions. But constant communication with people, talking about reasons why, showing the financial picture, letting people ask questions, let them understand. I mean, people said, felt like we weren't eliminating positions either, but when we could sit down and look at an org chart and position descriptions from three years prior to this year, they saw positions that they, some didn't even realize existed, you know, that weren't there anymore. And they saw ways in which the college had, um, actually did what it said they were doing, and that created a sense of respect, a, a sense of trust. Uh, and so it, it, it takes time, it takes effort, it takes communication, but I think that uh, it was very, it, in the scheme of things, two or three years, for that kind of a deficit uh, and, and, and dealing with it effectively, especially in an era of declining enrollment, really made a major difference for the college. Uh, they're now operating uh, at a surplus, and they're using that surplus to, uh, to uh, help with some of the deferred maintenance that we did over uh, the last five or six years, uh, which was, it was about three or four hundred million dollars in deferred maintenance that the college had to address, which means that the campus buildings were falling apart. <laughs> and uh, so for campus buildings built in the 60s and 70s, the vastly, so that was one of the strategies also to deal with some of the budget is they deferred maintenance. So, I mean, those are things that we're going to have to deal with because most community colleges were built in the 60s and 70s and had, a, I think, a, a tremendous amount of building needs. 1928 for this Yeah, this building's amazing. <laughs> it probably provides some challenges, though, because of being a historical. Yeah. So, but, uh, Hello, Dr. Taylor. Um, I'm Maya Dreger. I'm the interim academic dean, and I think we have a lot of parallels, which is neat, having been a technology professor and then a business and technology chair for a long time. And mm. uh, you're speaking my language when you started talking about geofencing. Nice. That just came up in a meeting a few weeks ago as an idea here. Um, so my question is kind of about, you know, you've kind of gone through this traditional path. You know, you're coming off of having uh, been a president in sort of a traditional sense and coming into um, a different type of a role that's um, not going to have any support staff, uh, which is going to be a challenge. And I'm curious to know um, how you envision your role interacting with the campuses on sort of a daily basis and what your first 100 days or so might look like. You know, I think one of the things that's clear is that this development of this structure is in process. I mean, even from December when it was first posted, it's changed. You know, what the regional presidents were going to do. I, for example, I think one of the one of the activities was that we're going to have the regional president run one of the campuses, and now they're not. And so, uh, you know, I think I have to be flexible in that approach. I, I think, you know, it's a, a you know a design engineering concept is to implement something that's not fully 100 percent. I mean, it's 70 or 80 percent, and I think that's kind of what uh, we're trying to do here in, in Connecticut. And so I think we have to be adapt uh, adaptive and face that this thing's going to change. In terms of the first 100 days, you know, it, it will be important for me to get out in, on each campus, identify who those key influences are, uh, start developing strong relationships with the campus CEOs and chief academic and chief uh, student service officers uh, to look at what the leadership teams at these institutions needs are and how I can address them, but also reaching out and getting to know the organization's strengths and weaknesses. I, I started looking at each of the campuses in, uh, you know, in ways that I could. I mean, look, going through the web pages and stuff. And there's a lot of diversity in the web pages amongst the five regions. And information you could find out at one, you couldn't find at another. And so it was a struggle. But, and so you can only learn so much, though, from web page and data. You, to really get down and understand and develop the relationships, you have to get out and interact with folks. And that's what I want to do. Uh, as a regional president, I see my, I have an audience, uh, three kind, kind of a three-pronged audience. There's the internal group at, at each campus. Then there's the community, uh, the regional community. I'll spend some time getting to know the different regions. I'll spend some time on uh, what I call the, 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 the community tours. I'll, I'll, I'll try to engage in with the city councils, the county boards at all of these uh, levels, uh, economic development entities throughout the state, uh, 
particularly throughout the region. I'll do uh, speeches and communication tours at like the Lions Club, the Rotaries, uh, whoever will have me trying to understand what the needs are of the community and the businesses in the organization. I'll also get out and work with the K-12s, trying to understand the challenges locally at the K-12 environments. I know that there's uh, one of the major challenges getting students academically prepared for college. Uh, many of our students come in that uh, aren't ready. What are some things that we could do uh, as uh, colleges, as a region, to help improve students' ability to come in prepared for, for college level work? I'll, I'll connect with the, of course, it'll be somewhat easier to connect with some of the universities to look at Kate, you know, and, uh, what articulation agreements are possible. Ours, uh, I know that the, it's called the TAP, the transfer, that's articulation policy, uh, exploring and learning that in more detail. What does that mean? Is, are, some, are there some ways to strengthen that? In Illinois, we had something called the Illinois Articulation Initiative. And uh, basically, it was similarly constructed to the TAP. But there was ways to strengthen those, uh, those and create enhanced articulation opportunities. Uh, for example, the University of Illinois, one of the leading engineering colleges in the world, they have like seven majors of engineering within their engineering college, which is a part of the University of Illinois. And within each major, civil engineering had different admissions requirements than electrical engineering, and electrical engineering had different requirements than mechanical. And so we created a, a, an articulation agreement. So if a student wanted to go to the University of Illinois, they wanted to major in civil engineering, this was their transfer program of study, which was a little bit different than their mechanical, which was a little bit different than their uh, civil, and so on. And so we called those enhanced agreements, but creating those opportunities to engage with the, 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 the universities in the state. And then finally, um, you know, creating an opportunity to work with the, the political entities within the region, uh, trying to get, make sure that I understand the needs of the, the community, the economic the development ideas that are out there, and how can the college and the region foster and develop those, those jobs for, for students in the future. So really spending a lot of time getting to know people, getting to understand uh, the region, getting to understand the college, and figuring out ways in which we can uh, start to work together to, to improve the, the teaching and learning for students here at our, our campuses. Hi, my name is Josephine, and I uh, run the Human Resources Department. Um, my, first, I want to explain a little bit about what's going on with, with our um, proposed restructuring. Um, as you may already know, um, the proposal is for HR, purchasing, IT, uh, and the business function to all be consolidated in a regional basis. Mm -hmm. um, I have been with the community college system for about 15 years. Mm -hmm. I came from private industry. <coughs> um, what I have found in my 15 years, both here and at another community college in, in our system, is that rather than uh, streamlining processes, we've more work has been added on. And as a result of the work being added on, um, I've been able to just adequately do what I'm supposed to do to support our employees, both on, from an HR perspective and a labor relations perspective. Um, and now I'm being told we're going to have less even more so. Some of the things that I struggle with is that, you know, at a maybe a systemic level, we're told, okay, this was something that was agreed upon with, with you know, a labor uh, union, and now we have to do something that is unimplementable in our system. <laughs> or that it, 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 it requires manual work. That takes work away from my employees that work for me. And, it, it, and then it, it, what it does is it takes away the ability for me to provide excellence. I'm providing adequate. So now I'm being told I have to do more with less. I see things that I know have to get done, that have to get done, that are essential for me to do my job well, to lead an HR function. But I also see things that don't need to get done and continue to get added. Um, how do you see that streamlining approach? Or how have you handled it um, when you've had to centralize well, Frontier Community College, again, multi-campus environment, OCC, multi-campus environment. And uh, at both of those institutions, those functions that you talked about, the business office, a lot of the, the, the back, what we call back-end services, uh, HR, uh, IT, a lot of those were centralized. And, and I think that that's 
it was an, an important uh, step for the college. It helped maintain affordability for, for tuition for students. It helped uh, the colleges stay uh, functioning financially. And so I, I think it, I've worked in those environments. I think the key is, is to, and you, and you kind of alluded to it a little bit, there's things out there that you're doing that's not important. And so what are those things? Let's identify what those things are and let's just jettison them or find out ways that if they have a critical component to them, is there a way to do those differently? I think looking at and, and trying to look at capability of folks, this is what we can truly accomplish in a, in a 40 hour week or 35 or whatever the work week is. Uh, or, these are the things that we can do, and these are the challenges that we have. I think communicating those, looking for ways to leverage technology. I think one of, there's exciting ways to leverage technology if we can do it correctly. And of course, that's the big if, if we can do it correctly, but engaging people in those conversations and talking about it, um, I think that's important. Uh, unfortunately, you know, there is a lot of work, especially in a transition, transitional period. But developing a sense of what the future is going to be and look like, I think is also important. Giving somebody hope that this is going to change and that the, the services are going to be different. And these are some things that are super important that we want to get accomplished and these are some things that we're going to not worry about anymore. And so, I mean, creating that sense of, of discussion, I think, is, is important to move forward and deal with those kinds of issues. The reality is, if you don't deal with them, the financial picture is going to eat you up. And it's going to create even worse it, uh, culture in an economic environment. Um, and it's going to suffer, have students suffer. It's going to have the community suffer. So we have to figure out ways to proactively deal with it. That doesn't necessarily mean that the, the financial piece wags the dog. You know? it, it's not necessarily the case because I see financial outcomes as uh, finance as an outcome of our processes and stuff. But we have to be strategic about it. And we have to, be, uh, uh, we have, to have real conversations. We can't have those real conversations and solve those problems unless we've developed that sense of mutual respect, trust, and open communication. Transparency. You hear people talk about it, but hopefully you get this sense. I'll tell you what I think, and I'll listen to you very intently to understand your point of views. And then we'll try to figure out mutually uh, beneficial solutions to those problems. And I think that's the only way to work through these things. It's going to be challenges. It's probably going to be uh, not two or three years here in Connecticut because of the, the, the geographic disparity and the geographic dispersion. You ha one of the things I learned as president early, early on at the Frontier Community College, you know, we were set up as a multi-campus environment. And in some ways, the campuses were competing with each other for resources. And that was just the culture of the organization. When we, one of the things that our, our, our chancellor did, our CEO, is he said, presidents, you come up with a strategic or student enrollment management plan, work together, come up with something. And we did. And what we started to do is I started to understand from the other campuses' perspective their needs. Then I started to understand the interdependency we had with each other. And then all of a sudden I became a cheerleader for that other campus. And they became a cheerleader for me. That process takes time. But it starts with working together, looking at mutually uh, the mutual goals, mutual responsibilities. We're not that different. I could probably list 10 or 12 things that we all agree on that are important. Students are our focus. I talked about learning is our purpose. Employees are our most important resource. You're in HR. I think we agree with that. I think most people do. Change is a way of life. It so defines our future. I think we can agree to that. I think ethical standards should guide our decisions. I think we can all agree that, you know, working together, we're stronger than working independently. So there's lots of things that we can agree on. Let's take those, build on those, and, and let's address the problems and issues in real time, in real ways, so that we can make a, a better future for our students and our community. Okay, so we have time for one more question, and then we'll give Dr. Taylor uh, an opportunity to speak fully in the Last question. Uh, good morning, Dr. Good morning. Taylor. John McNamara, I handle uh, grants and foundation work here at the Capitol. Um, and I know you're coming from an institution with multiple campuses, so you have to take a regional approach to, to things. One of the realities of uh, development and grants at the 12 community colleges is that the resources for that stuff is very uneven. And uh, uh, I'd like you to comment on your uh, 
what you've been able to do at Oakland and also on uh, how uh, a campus like ours, which has one FTE for all grants, development, and other stuff, how a regional office could be more responsive because neither under the old Board of Trustees nor under the current Board of Regents is much attention being paid to that. And uh, welcome to Hartford. <laughs> well, I've got a, uh, I've got a particular bias that I think the, the foundations uh, need to stay in the communities in which they, they currently are and connected to the, the colleges in which they're currently connected. Um, at Oakland Community College, uh, I was, we had a foundation executive director uh, an institute, who was in charge of institutional development. And, uh, mainly the college was focused on uh, scholarship development for students, uh, working out, reaching out. I think my most, uh, bre the breadth of my experience was at a Frontier Community College where I had my own foundation uh, for Frontier Community College. But, you know, Lincoln Trail had their own foundation, Wabash Valley had their own foundation, Omni Central had their own foundation, which were the four colleges within the, the Illinois Eastern Community College system. And what I learned is, is that the communities and the foundations took ownership of those colleges. And so that's why I think it's, it's important for the, each foundation to stay connected to that campus or that college, because the community around them feel a, a sense of connection. Um, there is also a, a usually a framework uh, already in place. Our Frontier Community College Foundation had a, a connection with the, the hospitals foundation, had a connection with some of the banking foundations, had a, some of the community foundations. They already knew people. Some of the same people served on both boards. And so creating that connection, I think, was important. Uh, the fundraising elements, uh, creating opportunities uh, for individuals to create endowed scholarships and, and the president out in the community being the face and, and, and working to develop those, uh, those, those contacts and those relationships and making the ask to bring uh, money into, the, into the, the, the college made sense. Engaging the college in the strategic planning initiatives made a whole lot of uh, uh, sense for us because all of, uh, all of the foundations were, were great at wanting to give students scholarships, but we needed help with infrastructure development. We needed help with new program development. And uh, kind of the, engaging the foundations in those strategic partnerships, they became excited about helping us build five new programs at Frontier Community College and help me build a facility so that I could house those five new programs. And so just creating that sense of, of, um, of ownership from the foundation and connection uh, where they started engaging in, in those kinds of activities made sense. I think what we would want to do here from a regional perspective is, is pay attention to the local connections and, and strengthen those as much as we can and then try to see if there's ways to leverage uh, work together. I don't know what those would look like right now and I think we would have to explore that. Um, there's probably ways to, to uh, share uh, resources as well. Uh, one of the things we used at Oakland Community College was some CRM software as like Razor's Edge or something like that. Is that, is that one of them? Very expensive. Very expensive. But if we had five foundations working together regionally, maybe that deferred the cost amongst those. Um, there's, probably, there's probably areas where there's overlap and, and uh, where there's com community members that could be part of the Manchester Foundation or could, or could be part of the Capitol uh, Community College Foundation. How do, we, how do we work those so that they're beneficial for both? Uh, and so there's probably opportunities to work together. Um, I think ultimately we, engaging, having discussions, creating relationships. I, that's really what it's all about. And that's really the role of, the, I think, of the, the regional president is to really help look and recognize opportunities when they exist, create opportunities when they don't, and then uh, help uh, the organization grow and serve students in the community in, in, in new and exciting ways. Okay. So any concluding remarks? I just want to say thank you for your attention and your time. I know it takes uh, a lot of uh, effort to come out and be part of, of stuff like this. I, I want you to feel like as you evaluate regional candidates, uh, you need somebody like me who has the ability to build bridges, has the, who has the experience of building bridges, that has the ability to create uh, partnerships, has the ability to, do, to deal with 
um, challenges, but deal with the challenges in ways that, that build instead of divide. And I think that I'm that person, and I hope that you see that in me, and I hope that uh, I can see you soon. So thank you much for your time and attention. Thank you.